Hi, I'm Deanna Jo, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. Today, I'd just like to talk about seven red flags that could indicate an unhealthy church or faith community. And my first red flag is spiritual abuse. And this is something that people may not even realize they've experienced. They recognize an issue with how they were treated or how a situation was handled, but they've never actually thought to put the label of abuse on it. There are various definitions of spiritual abuse, and I'm just going to share two of them with you. So the first one is, according to the National Domestic Violence Hotline, most examples of spiritual abuse refer to a church elder or a faith leader inflicting abuse on congregation members, often by creating a toxic culture within the church or group, by shaming or controlling members using the power of their position. And it also said, however, <laughs> spiritual abuse can also occur within an intimate partner relationship. And that is a whole topic that I'm going to cover by itself in another video because this is a problem within the Christian community. But another definition is David Johnson and Jeff Van Vonderen, co-authors of the book, The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse. And I've plugged that book multiple times on my channel. It's an excellent book. They have a paragraph that says it's possible to become so determined to defend a spiritual place of authority, a doctrine, or a way of doing things that you wound and abuse anyone who questions or disagrees or doesn't behave spiritually the way you want them to. Humiliation from the pulpit is too common and it is abuse and recently there was a, a video that was shared of a minister who got up and read off the names of everybody who didn't attend <laughs> in the middle of this COVID pandemic and basically said you need to be here next week there's no excuse for not being here and so that was terrible but it's not as uncommon as you think and um, so if you have a pastor who's just outright naming names like that guy, or maybe your pastor is being passive aggressive and giving people digs and vaguely dealing with situations over the pulpit because he's too cowardly to just go to them in person in love and have a respectful conversation. Either way, it's a toxic environment. And when a bully launches his attacks from behind a pulpit, it is so disempowering to his victims because they can't defend themselves. Another sign of spiritual abuse in your group is you get beat down every time they gather and you leave feeling depressed. Everything's negative. And so oftentimes people will want to pull back from that, but then of course they come at you with the old forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so they try to keep you uh, obligated to sitting and taking the negativity and abuse. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, but let's start at verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. And our hope is uh, faith in Christ. Without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is that when he says, as is the habit of some, it does seem to have a bit of a gentle tone to it, not a tone of condemnation and how fire and brimstone like it's presented sometimes. But like, what is the purpose of gathering together then? Well, according to that, verse 24, to stir one another to love and good works and to encourage one another. And so if that really happens at your church or group and every gathering turns into the rantings of a madman lecturing and correcting, then it might be time to just move on because life is too short. Um, a point of clarity here, just because a leader says he's called, be it to your area, to your church, or even to the ministry, it doesn't necessarily mean he is. Just because someone says they're a Christian doesn't mean they are. Not all pastors are Christians. I know that might blow your socks off. That's it's the truth. Um, you know, while some do pursue that line of work out of love and a genuine desire to help people, 
Some are just self-serving narcissists who are hungry for power and status and you are nothing more to them than narcissistic supply. And you give that to them in the form of attention and admiration. And I know, <laughs> I know I'm treading on uh, thin ice here, but if you think I'm wrong, look up the 10 professions that attract the most narcissists. Actually, it applies to sociopaths and psychopaths as well. And clergy is listed <laughs> in all of those uh, lists. Um, I mean, it is a quick route to status and social prestige within the Christian community, and we need to be very careful. And I'm also gonna go so far as to say that I do think that the more your church elevates the ministry, so a lot of the more evangelical uh, fundamentalist type groups, this is just my opinion, <laughs> but I tend to think that they probably have a higher percentage of narcissists because there is more admiration and status involved there. Just my opinion. But it's not a new problem. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And the next verse says, By their fruit, you will recognize them. Well, I mean, a good measuring stick would be the fruit of the Spirit, wouldn't it? Not that people are expected to be perfect because ministers and leaders are just people, but... It's not hard to recognize when somebody is not walking in the fruit of the Spirit at all. Another common sign of spiritual abuse in a church or group is a lack of boundaries. And, you know, I've heard some crazy stories since I started this channel. And I don't know, if you have to ask your pastor's permission to take a vacation, to, to change jobs or to take a job, if you have to ask them who to date, who to marry about buying a house, buying a car, who you can be friends with, what kind of music you can listen to, what you can wear. Um, you know, that's not healthy. <laughs> I would assume people would know that, but you know, you almost just get groomed to a point where you, you know, your boundary lines are blurry. And um, I would also say asking your pastor's permission to attend another church for service is ridiculous and it's none of his business. If extra biblical legalistic rules are required for you to maintain good standing within your group or Christian community, that's not healthy. And so my second red flag would be false teaching of major doctrines. So if, you're if your pastor is teaching salvation by faith, plus works or like grace plus run <laughs> get out of there you know it's one thing to encourage one another unto good works that's a good thing you know we just read that in hebrews 10 and then james uh chapter 2 verses 14 through 26 talk about how faith without works is dead so true faith does produce good works but <clears throat> it doesn't produce perfection not in behavior and, you know, you have Christians terrified of making a mistake and losing their salvation. And we're not saved by good behavior. It's faith in Christ alone that saves us. We still mess up from time to time. We're just people. And to frame every single thing as a means to either gain heaven or a one-way ticket to hell, in my opinion, that's abusive and it's fear-inducing, and it completely bypasses the power of the gospel. Our walk of faith is not a precarious one. We can have confidence. If you honestly think that your good behavior will earn you a spot in heaven, you're arrogant, and you have no understanding of the holiness of God. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You know, you're not saved for like 10 minutes when you first come to Christ and put your faith in him and then boom all of a sudden all the responsibility is back on your shoulders and from then on it's on you and you spend the rest of your life with your fingers crossed walking a slippery slope and hoping for the best you know I once heard it said everybody sins believer and unbeliever 
there's a difference. The unbeliever is comfortable with their sin. It doesn't bother them. They're okay with it. The believer is not. And, you know, we feel bad about it and we're repentant and we're making an effort not to sin because we want to live a life that's pleasing to God because we love him. Um, and we strive to be like him. So if we can't earn our right standing or our righteousness with God, how do we get it? It comes through faith, not through achieving perfect behavior. Thank goodness, because if that was the case, there wouldn't be a soul on planet Earth that would ever go to heaven. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, For the gospel reveals the righteousness of God that comes by faith from start to finish. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith, or the just shall live by faith. For our 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That was it. That was the divine exchange. He took my sin and he paid for that. And in exchange, he gave me his righteousness. And so now I stand before God righteous. Not that I am, but I'm in Christ. And he was righteous. And so therefore, so am I. And anything that opposes that is a false teaching about the gospel. And for heaven's sakes, if you don't even have the gospel right, that's not some place you need to go. I would also say be wary of a church or a group with an unhealthy focus on anything besides the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't ever talk about anything else, but there are churches who really put their focus on these other things. So like a strong emphasis on supernatural experiences. Um, some of them put a strong emphasis on supernatural revelation and sometimes to the point where it supersedes scripture. Um, clothing as an outward sign of holiness um, and separation or even some groups put a big focus on prosperity and they end up really focused on material possessions and wealth. I mean I know we're all different and so you're bound to have differences of opinion within groups and I like that. I think that's a good thing. It's, it makes it more interesting. It makes for better discussion. But some doctrines are just damaging and they take our eyes off of Jesus and that is what we want to avoid. My third red flag is leadership issues. Now some leaders are kind and loving and they care deeply about people and others are demanding and controlling and rude and hateful. <laughs> you know, some of them have unrepentant sin, some of them are abusers and others cover for abusers. I mean, I mentioned the narcissism component before. That's something to be careful of. When leadership is corrupt and church politics and partiality decide everything, your church will start feeling more like a corrupt little kingdom than a community of fellowship and support for believers. And you're better off leaving and maintaining good, a good spirit than to stay and put up with the mess until you eventually limp out the other side and you've got a bunch of forgiven to do and a bunch of healing to do. Another thing to be careful of in leadership is pastor worship. It can go beyond loving and respecting your pastor to just downright idolatry. And I've seen it. Um, we have one mediator between God and us. And it's not your pastor. It's Christ Jesus. And if things have reached the point where you're getting celebrity ministers <laughs> to autograph your Bible, I kid you not, I've heard of this. <laughs> Dude, things have gone too far here. Um, can you imagine approaching the Apostle Paul for an autograph? Like, how do you think he would have reacted? Or Jesus? I mean, like... It blows my mind. You know, I've heard of demanding pastors who are almost treated like royalty and their saints wait on them hand and foot. You know, Jesus speaks to his disciples in Mark 10 about Christian leadership. If you start at verse 42, it says, And Jesus called them to him and said, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. 
Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Humility and servanthood should be the marks of Christian leadership. Uh, not It should not be dictatorships. My fourth red flag no opportunity to use your gifts and talents. Um, if it's a one-man show or a one-family show and your group and they won't allow anyone else to share their gifts, you might want to find someplace else to fellowship. And some churches have unrealistic rules for being used, spoken or unspoken. And that's a sneaky way of eliminating people from having opportunities. But if they require total control over your personal life, or your finances, or your time, or your closet, that's a red flag for an unhealthy boundaries. I've also seen opportunities dangled in front of people as bait to control them and then withdrawn as punishments if they misstep or disagree. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of one church in particular I attended. It was not a UPC church. And uh, it placed a friend of mine on probation from praising in for like six months. Um, and her crime <laughs> was attending the opening services of a new church in our community. And she just attended to show support. Uh, the pastor, I can, I can just remember we were both, uh, ushering that night. And I remember sitting at the back with her and she's like telling him where she went. And I'm thinking, oh my word, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I mean, you could tell just by the look on his face, he was not impressed and I mean, he basically told her she should have been in service in her own church. She should have never gone. And you could tell he was not impressed. And she, of course, was shocked. I mean, she just assumed as believers that we would all be working towards the same goal and we would love and support one another. But sadly, she found out just how territorial churches and pastors can be. And, you know, no, I don't think anybody said anything to her, but her name disappeared from the praising and list immediately following that. And, you know, she's a godly woman, and that really hurt her because she was somebody who really enjoyed singing. This kind of thing happens all the time. My fifth red flag is money issues and dishonesty, greed, fraud, lack of accountability, and waste are some of the things to watch for. You know, you have a right to be comfortable with how your money is being spent. And if you attend a church and your pastor is living way above the standard of living of everybody in your community, and he's doing it all on your dime, you have every right to take an interest in that. And I'm not talking about nickel and diamond, your poor pastor for every purchase he makes. <laughs> you know, people do that too, and that's not right. You know, he has a right to a normal life and a vacation for his family and new sneakers for his kids and stuff. You know, sometimes people are people are really hard on uh, leaders that way. And that's not right either. That's not what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about leaders who shake their saints down for every cent they can get out of them. And the first family lives like royalty taking extravagant trips and driving status vehicles and dressing in brand name clothing and designer clothing from head to toe, you know, while the saints in their church are barely scraping by. I'm also talking about churches wasting money on unnecessary building expansions and upgrades. And that's especially sad when they're maybe not doing anything to help their community and to help the poor. Um, how about when every member of the pastor's family ends up on salary at the church, even though the church can't afford it? And I've heard people say, well, I, I just pay my tithes and the church will have to account to God for how they spend it. Well, first off, mandatory tithing for Christians is not biblical, but it's a free country. And if you want to, you know, give 10% or 20% or I don't know, 50%, whatever you want to give to your church, that's entirely up to you. But the idea that you can just float through blindly and not take responsibility for anything is ridiculous. You know, we need to be a good steward of our finances, and that involves knowing how our money is being spent. 
1 Peter 4.10 speaks of us being good stewards and managers of the grace of God and our various gifts as we serve one another. So finances would be no different. We've outsourced way too much responsibility to pastors and churches, and it's not biblical. We need to take responsibility for our own faith and everything that entails. My sixth red flag is exclusivity. Um, is your church or organization like a little island? Do they only love themselves? Are they like an elite little social club with no presence in your community? And I don't just mean occasionally tormenting people to go to church. You know, I mean, are they in the community? Are they helping the poor, visiting the sick, helping the widows, the single moms, the elderly? You know, do they attend community benefits? Are they being the hands and feet of Jesus and showing his love? with no agenda or are they mean <laughs> and you have to be a part of their little circle to get any help has your pastor led your church for years swears he was called to your area and hardly knows a living soul outside the four walls of your church you know, I'm originally from a rural area and they have community benefits all the time. Like say somebody had a house fire and maybe didn't have insurance or like if someone has extra medical expenses, they'll have like a community breakfast or whatever to raise money to help the family. And uh, someone once asked the local gentleman why nobody from his church ever attends community benefits. And the man responded that it's because they have no money left to give. The church gets it all. People in the community notice when the only time Christians bother is to get them to come to church. You know, it's not a good testimony when the only time we care is when we have something to gain. And my seventh and final red flag is when the demands of your group become burdensome. Um, so maybe you live too far away to attend regularly. I've heard of people moving away and their pastors basically saying you're going to have to travel and still attend this church. That's ridiculous. Go find a church close to you or a home group or whatever it is. Whatever it is you want to attend, that's ridiculous. Um, maybe you or your children have special needs and your church does not offer programs or, you know, accommodations. Go find a church that does. There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe you don't fit in socially in the group you're in or, you know, you don't enjoy their style of service. It's okay to find some place you do feel comfortable. I mean, we established earlier the purpose of meeting together is fellowship and encouragement. If your church is upset when people miss service and consider you unfaithful, first of all, we're called to be faithful to God, not, to, not in attendance to a church building. But, you know, there are going to be times when we're going to have to miss. You know, maybe you're going to have to work. Maybe, you know, you're going to be sick or there's going to be health issues that arise. You might have a family get together. Now, I'm just going to offer you a little piece of life advice here. Um, if your family has a 90th birthday cookout for grandma and it's on a church night, go to the party, okay? <laughs> you know, you're never going to get to the end of your life and wish you'd squeezed in more church services, but I can guarantee when grandma dies, you are going to be thankful for every minute that you spent with her and every memory you made. But if I leave my church and go elsewhere, people might call me a church hopper. Well, what does the Bible say about church hoppers? Absolutely nothing, because it's not a thing. It's just a term somebody came up with to manipulate and embarrass people who leave a church and go to another church for whatever reason. And a lot of times people have good reasons for leaving their group and going elsewhere. And I have to say, normal life brings changes and it's healthy. People move to different areas. They sell houses that no longer meet their needs anymore. They change jobs for various reasons, you know, and you even outgrow friendships. In, in the fact that, you know, you just, you're in different places in life and you're heading in different directions. And I mean, you maintain, you know, good, good relationships, but you're just not in the same place anymore and you grow apart. That's normal. It's all part of growth and change. And that is what life is. But for some reason, churches can feel a lifetime sense of entitlement to your presence. 
And it just, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes you have to part ways. And we even see it supported in scripture. Acts 15, 36 through 41, you have Paul and Barnabas, and they disagreed over whether to take John Mark with them on their second missionary journey. Now, this was not a doctrinal dispute. This was just a matter of personal opinion. And, you know, it, remind, it kind of reminds me of people who say, well, you can't just leave a church because you don't like the music. Why not? <laughs> Go someplace that you fit and that you enjoy it and that you'll be encouraged. I don't understand what the big deal is. Um, you know, and, and back to Paul and Barnabas, I mean, their disagreement was so contentious that they split from each other. And Paul took Silas and Barnabas took John Mark and they went their separate ways. And you know what? We don't know if they ever crossed paths again. We don't see that in scripture, but scripture never condemned them for that. And Paul speaks warmly of Barnabas in a future letter and encourages the believers at Corinth to support him. So they maintained a good spirit, or at least they regained it after they get over maybe their contention and irritation, but they went their separate ways. And, you know, sometimes it is healthy and even necessary to split company. And... I just wanted to encourage you with a few of these, and I'm sure there's more red flags than this uh, for an unhealthy group or uh, church, but these are just a few. And uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, you can hit the like button. And if you want YouTube to notify you whenever I put out a new one, you can subscribe and hit the little notification bell and you'll be notified. So anyway, I hope you have a great day.